Please do open your Bibles to the first letter of Peter, chapter 1, and we're going to begin reading this morning at verse 13. First Peter, chapter 1, and verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by obedience to the truth, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly, From a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Thus far, the word of God. Let's pray. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we are so thankful once again to have your word open before us. And we pray now that you would minister to us through your word. May we know it to be living and abiding an imperishable seed in our hearts. So please open our eyes, open our minds, open our hearts to hear your voice speaking to us this morning. Bless us, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, once again, we have the incredible privilege of opening this letter of Peter's, his elect exile's guide to the Christian life. In the first two weeks of our studies together, we we looked at these glorious opening verses, verses 1 to 12, and there Peter celebrates what God has done for believers in Jesus Christ. He rejoices in the Trinitarian salvation that we enjoy because of the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He rejoices in the imperishable inheritance that is ours, that is kept for us by the power of God so that it is untouched by death, unstained by evil, and unimpaired by time. He marvels that this same power that preserves our inheritance, that raised Christ from the dead, is also at work to guard us for that inheritance that is being kept for us. He reminds us of the believer's supernatural ability to rejoice in suffering. Because those trials are used by God, sovereignly ordained by God to refine us 
And they result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he reminds us again of the privilege we have and the privilege those elect exiles have of living in the days after the promised Redeemer had been revealed, after he had come into this world. The privilege of knowing that we live in the times that angels long to look into. And so having begun with what God has done, Peter moves from the indicative to the imperative. Now, an indicative, boys and girls, is just simply a statement of what has been done, what is true already. That's an indicative. And an imperative is simply what must be done. So when your parents tell you to tidy your room, that is an imperative. That is something that must be done. And here, Peter moves then from the indicative to the imperative. But before he exhorts Christians how to live, remember, he, he begins with this doxology of praise, exulting in the wonders of our salvation in Christ. He's reveling in what God has brought about, what God has done. And this is, this is vital, this is crucial for us to understand. The imperatives of Christian living, and there are imperatives, but these imperatives always begin with therefore. They always begin with what is true, what has been accomplished, what is finished. Samuel Benetro, a, a French theologian, wrote this, without the indicative of what God does, the imperative is, in, is addressed to a helpless sinner, the victim of his illusions. It becomes a commandment that crushes or that drives to vain and presumptuous efforts. Unless we begin with what God has done in Christ, we're either going to be crushed by commandments we have absolutely no hope of keeping, or we become self-righteous and proud, and we begin to believe that we can earn God's favor. But beloved, the, the power for Christian living is never found by searching inside ourselves, by pedaling harder or faster. Now, we need a place to rest. We need a firm foundation. We need a fountain that never runs dry. And God has given that to us. He has given us hope, a living hope, an inheritance that is created for us by Christ's resurrection. And because we have this hope, because we have this hope, Peter then calls us to live in that hope. He describes the appropriate response in the lives of those who have received such indescribable grace. And he shows that the only way we can live this out is because of what he's described there in the first 12 verses of this chapter. Well, look, look now to, to the beginning of our passage this morning in verse 13 as we come to our exposition. Peter begins this section with the, the Greek word dio, which as we've seen is, is therefore. It means for this reason. And that reason, as we've seen, reaches back into all of verses 1 to 12. Believers are to obey because they are God's elect exiles, chosen by him, begotten by the Father, because they have an untouchable inheritance and because of their supremely great salvation. Now, this is the glorious thing about all of God's commandments. They are always, always rooted in God's grace, in his grace. And specifically, Peter brings out here, this is an eschatological grace, an eschatological grace. That's just a fancy way of saying grace that is, it is coming to us 
at the end of time, in the, in the last days. Grace that will be brought to you when? At the revelation of Christ. We are to set our hope fully, literally that is perfectly, on grace. We look back by faith to the perfect, completed work of Christ, the, the glorious salvation that he's won for us, and we look forward in hope to grace and not judgment at the coming of Christ. We were saved by grace, and we have even more grace to look forward to, Peter's saying. And this is really important for us, because sometimes I do think that we slip into thinking that God owes us that, that final glory, that final reward, because of something that we've done in our Christian life. But we need to fix this liberating truth in our minds. We didn't deserve salvation. We didn't earn it. We had no right to it. Our redemption was sheer grace. And beloved, it is going to be no different when Christ is revealed on that final day, it will be unmerited blessing then as it was when we were saved. It will be undeserved kindness then as it was when we were saved. We will no more deserve the redemption of these sinful bodies that are so polluted by iniquity than we, reserve the, than we deserve the redemption of our polluted souls. We will no more deserve our home in heaven than we deserve our place in the church. We will no more deserve the eternal weight of glory than we deserve the indwelling spirit of glory now. None of us, none of us can save ourselves. None of us can keep ourselves saved by our own strength. And none of us can earn that ultimate salvation in glory. Paul says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Peter shows us then how we are to set our hope fully on Christ. First, it's by preparing our minds for action, he says. And that phrase is literally, in, in the Greek, girding up the loins of your mind. Now, children, boys and girls, have you ever seen pictures of uh, perhaps people who lived in the time of Jesus? Have you noticed the kind of clothes they used to wear? Men and women and boys and girls, they would all wear these sort of long, flowing robes. Uh, they weren't particularly practical for uh, hard work or for, for running, for fast movement. Uh, you'd be tripping over all of the, the folds in the, in the robe. And so when they, when they were planning to do something really physical, when they wanted to maybe run a race or um, work hard in the garden, they would gird up these robes. They would tuck them up into their belt and they would have their, their legs free then for, for action. We might say something similar today. We might say of someone that they are going to roll up their sleeves if they're going to get down to, to some real hard work. Loved ones, God has designed us in a very specific way. He's, he's made the mind as the pathway to our souls, to our hearts. And so Peter's point is that we set our hope on future grace, not by idle wishfulness or unfounded optimism, but by a serious mental resolve. Resolve to live in such a way as to show the living hope that we have in Christ. It's a hope that is to be recognized and acted upon now. But this hope doesn't become a reality for us without this kind of disciplined thinking, the kind of thinking that re requires us to gird up the loins of our minds. Well, then how do we do this? How do we do this? Peter says it is by being sober 
minded, by being sober minded. We're to be spiritually self controlled, he's saying, not intoxicated with the empty philosophies of, of this world. Because there is a way of, of living that, that makes us dull to the reality of God. We can be sort of anesthetized by the attractions of this world. It's a kind of spiritual drunkenness that causes us to, to have a blurry vision, even to lose sight altogether of Christ's future revelation of himself. And so we are to resist that, resist that way of thinking, and instead be sober-minded. But this, this sober-mindedness is not a joyless gloom. It's not morbid. We have a glad hope in the glorious Christ, in the grace that is ours now, and when we see him face to face. And so by being ready for action, resolved to live in a way that, that shows our hope, being spiritually self-controlled, we set our hope fully on the grace of Christ. And so Peter, having established this firm foundation, issues three calls to believers. First, in verses 14 to 16, believers are, are called to conform to God, to conform to to God. Then second, in verses 17 to 21, believers are called to reverence. Reverence. And then third, in verses 22 to 25, believers are called to brotherly love. So the first call then is in verse 15. Peter writes, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. What does it mean? To be holy. The character of God is holy, isn't it? He is completely pure. There's, there's no trace of sin in him. And so this concept of holiness then refers to purity. Although really that's, that's the secondary meaning of holiness. The first and primary meaning of the term refers to God's transcendent majesty. His, his otherness. It is the sense in which God is entirely different. He is set apart from anything and anyone in the created order. It is his godness, if you like. And so Peter then is calling us to be set apart as God's people. We are to be intentionally different to everyone else. So this holiness is not limited to, to a handful, even, even an enormous amount of holy actions. No, it is to extend, Peter says, to all of our conduct. And the way that we do this is found in verse 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. And that, that phrase there, obedient children was originally a, a, a lovely Hebrew idiom. Um, perhaps to get more of the sense of, of what's being said here, it might be better to translate it, children of obedience. Those whose, those whose parents are obedience. And so as Christians, we are new creations. We're not to be shaped by the, the, the former lusts that we have. We're, we're no longer Sons of disobedience. Our parents are obedience. Those former lusts, that ignorance that we once walked in, that's not what living hope produces. In Christ, we are freed from the passions of our former ignorance. Instead, of being, instead we are being conformed to holiness, even, even to the image of the glory of the Lord. And Peter tells us why, why we're to be holy in verse 16. And it's very simple. We're to be holy because God is holy. Peter quotes from Leviticus. And if you've ever read through that book, you know that the one thing Leviticus teaches us is that God is holy. He's holy on a, on a level that is utterly unlike anyone or anything else. 
But here's the astounding thing. Here's the thing that Peter has got a hold of. God, in his infinite holiness, makes us, people like us, his people. We belong to him. And he calls us to bear his image, to be conformed to him. He makes us the children of obedience. And so we're to be holy for his sake, because we're identified as his children. We're to hope because of what it says about him, because it glorifies him. The second call that Peter makes is found in verse 17. He says, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. And this this fear is not the, the kind of servile fear that a prisoner might have for his torturer, but this is a, a kind of familial fear that a child has for his parents. The, the child loves his parents. The child respects his parents. And, and so he fears ever offending or disappointing or misrepresenting them. It's a fear uh, that is born in, in reverence from a, from a spirit of adoration. And Peter shows us that in Christ we're brought into new relationships with God. He's our father, verse 17. He's our judge, although we are now certain of a favorable verdict, also in verse 17. And he's our redeemer, verse 18, the one who has ransomed us. And so these new relationships They all call for an attitude of reverence, of godly fear. Our friendship with the Lord, our reveling in his gracious love, banishes all other fears except for the one fear that is necessary. This is is the fear in which we are to conduct ourselves throughout the time of our exile. You remember who Peter is writing to, the the initial audience of this letter. These were new Christians who were on the brink of immense suffering, if not already experiencing it. They may have feared for for their jobs, for their liberties, for even for their lives. But Peter calls them to have a proper reverence to God so that they might not fear suffering so much as dread sinning against and grieving their heavenly Father. And so too for us. As Pastor Josh has often said, God reorders all of our fears. The fear of God reorders every other fear. And so our highest regard must be constantly for God and not for men, not for the circumstances around us, whether they are enticing to us or whether they are intimidating to us. And this godly fear is not just to come upon us occasionally. It is to be maintained by us throughout the duration of our exile. It has to burn steadily within us throughout the whole course of our walk in this life. If we become casual or flippant in our relationship to God, it is to our great detriment. But, but, if he is our one holy fear then we'll be set free from all other fears, whether they be in heaven or hell or earth or time or eternity. Well, the third call Peter makes is in verse 22. He says, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Peter is calling here for us to have brotherly love for one another. You know, sometimes in our Christian walk, we we come across paradoxes, don't we? Things that, that don't quite seem to make sense, and we, we might detect one here. We know, don't we, that, that the Bible tells us that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. We're to love God totally, with, with everything that we have. But if we're doing that, doesn't that then mean that we don't have any love left over for the people around us? our brothers and sisters. How can we do what Peter is calling us to here? But here's the glorious truth. With God, his, by his command and, and by his enabling power, those who love him completely 
are also able to love others as no one else can. Jesus shows us this. He links these two things together by an unbreakable bond. You remember when the lawyer asks Jesus, what is, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus responds by, by summing up the first four of the Ten Commandments. He's saying, we're to love God with all our heart. But, but he doesn't stop there, does he? He goes on to speak of a second commandment. The lawyer asks him, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus gives him two. A second commandment that could be distinguished from the first, but not separated from it. He says we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. And that is an inevitable fruit of loving God above all. We love our neighbor as ourselves as an inevitable fruit of loving God alone. And so what Peter is calling us to here is the fruit of loving God with all we have. He's calling for brotherly love. Perhaps he was remembering the words that he heard Jesus say, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The first great commandment is inseparably bound to the second, and we ought never to tear apart what God has joined together. So how should we love one another? Well, first, Peter says, with purified souls. From purified souls comes a love that is pure, a love that is undefiled and undefiling. Our love should be holy and seek to encourage holiness in our brothers and sisters. And second, Peter tells us we should love sincerely. It's not a fake, put-on love. It's a, a real, deep, genuine love that flows from a heart of compassion. Third, we're to love earnestly. Our love ought not to be weak in strength or minimal in quantity. Jesus tells us, doesn't he, just as I have loved you, you also love one another. And so our love is to be like Jesus' love, warm, zealous, strong, sacrificial. And then fourth, we're to love thoroughly. Our love is to be from the heart, from a pure heart, we're to treasure our brethren in our hearts, not just loving them when we're face to face with them, but keeping them in our hearts and prayers continually. Where does this love come from then? Well, Peter points out again that believers have been born again. They've been regenerated, called from death in sin to a new life in Christ. They are new creations. They have new desires as children of their heavenly father, as children of obedience. They have a new direction for their lives from God's word, and they are filled by the Spirit with new power to know and delight in the will of God. And what's true of these Christians in Asia Minor is true of you. If your hope and trust is in Christ alone, then you too have been born again. How were these believers born again? How is anyone born again? The Spirit of God uses God's scriptures to bring people out of death and into life. And so Peter calls the word of God the seed of the new birth. It's, it's an imperishable seed, a precious seed. The word of God is not simply information that we can take or leave. But Paul calls the gospel, doesn't he? the word of God, the power of God to salvation. And in verse 25, Peter refers to the preached word. Faithful, biblical preaching serves as the source and sustaining power of our new life in Christ. And so this word then is living and abiding. It is imperishable. The grass withers and the flower falls but the word of the Lord remains forever. The word of God will remain forever, a living force giving holy and loving life to believers. So then what is Peter driving at in these verses? What does he want to impress upon these elect exiles? He's calling these believers to holy 
living. But he doesn't just give them a bare command. He doesn't just tell them, be holy, and then leave them to it. No, he gives them the key, the source, the, the fountainhead for holy living. And that's, that's our doctrine this morning. Hope set fully on the grace that is ours in Christ is the fountainhead of holy living. Holiness, righteous living, obedience to the will of the Father is not something that we can conjure up from inside us. It's not something that we can produce in our own strength. Holy living must spring from the fountain of hope set fully on Christ. So then what does it mean? What does it mean to set our hope fully as Peter says, on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, it means with minds that are prepared for action, primed, ready to work, minds that are sober, minds that refuse to be enticed or intoxicated by worldly thinking, we aim those minds in a certain direction. By faith, we appropriate the liberating and empowering truth of God. And as we do, we're well equipped to to stand and to serve God as more than conquerors, Paul says. We fix our minds on our ultimate hope, which, which when it is grasped rightly by faith, sustains us in time just as much as it will compensate us inconceivably in eternity. And so the object of our hope is the grace of God, which, which we currently have, and by which we do stand and serve the Lord. Yet, yet the grace that we know and experience now is, is just a, a small taste, just a, a pledge, a down payment of a fullness that far outweighs any sufferings we might be called to endure now. The Puritans used to call grace young glory. Young Glory, that's a great description, isn't it? It is, it is that grace that, that culminates in glory that is to be the center of our hope. Our hope, our hope isn't that, that our persecutors will grow tired of persecuting us, that, that, our, that the opposition we face will, will somehow be diminished. That's not our hope. Our hope isn't in anything earthly. Not in attainments, not in anything we can do, not in any change that might come to our circumstances. We hope entirely and fully and completely in the Lord. As the psalmist says, it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. This hope, then, is a fixed certainty. That word that we have translated fully is teleos, and it means uh, perfectly, completely, literally, to the end. And so we're to have this determined, unchangeable focus, not on the things of this world that fade and fall like the flower of grass, but on heavenly, unchangeable things. We're to fix our hope on Christ, seated at the right hand of God the Father. And when our faith fixes on his final revelation, when our hope is put entirely in that, when he appears and every eye shall see him and every knee shall bow to him, then we are fortified to endure any trial that comes our way during the period of our exile. And this hope then is buttressed and and strengthened as we look back at what God has done for us in Christ, when we consider the price that has been paid for us. That we were ransomed, Peter says, ransomed from the futile ways inherited from our forefathers, not with perishable things like gold or silver, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. When we consider that the perfect, innocent lamb of God, Jesus Christ, shed his 
precious blood. The value of that blood is infinitely more than all the silver or gold this world has ever seen. When we consider that our salvation was not the result of some divine afterthought, that it was meticulously planned in eternity past, that that the source of our salvation was not ultimately some need in us or some desire in us even to be saved, but rather the inscrutable mercy of God that he planned and purposed before the foundation of the world to make a new creation, a new creation that would issue from his eternal son's incarnation, from his perfect life and sin atoning death, that the Father's seal of approval, his, his acceptance of his son's work was raising him from the dead and exalting him to the, the place of highest honor at his right hand in glory. When we consider these things, our hope is strengthened, fortified, buttressed. When Peter mentions that foreknowledge of God in verse 20, he shows us that not only was the price of our redemption immeasurably great, but also the planning, the planning that determined the payment of our redemption was extensive. Think about this. The planning that God put into our salvation was more extensive even than all of time itself. These are glorious, lofty thoughts, aren't they? But Peter makes them powerfully personal when he adds that all of this, All of this was done for the sake of you. For the sake of you. For you, beloved. He has done all these things for your good. And now here's the wonderful truth. As we do this, as we fix our hope and our faith and our sight on Jesus, on what he has done, on the grace that is ours in him, and the grace that is coming to us in that future glorious day, then, then we are transformed. Then we become to to be like him. We begin to be holy. Listen to how Paul puts it in his letter to the Corinthians. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Or well, listen to, to John, how he puts it in, in 1 John and chapter 3. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. By hoping in him, in his grace, we are purified. We are made holy. We are given what we lack so completely and totally, and we are enabled, empowered to live holy lives. Our lives are transformed so that we live with godly, reverent fear before God, and we're set free to love one another with pure, sincere, brotherly love. Love that is markedly different from anything the world could ever produce. So when we place our hope, all of our hope, in Christ, we can never, ever be disappointed. And only when we do this can we live as exiles in this world. Our affections are set on heavenly glory, the glory to which we are destined. And because Our affections are set this way. We live now in ever-growing conformity to our heavenly, holy Father who loves us with a love that can never be fully comprehended. And we're being made more like his precious Son who gave himself for us. And all this is being worked in us by the Holy Spirit who now indwells us and sanctifies us. So having considered this glorious truth then, what are our duties? Well, first, first we must examine ourselves. Examine ourselves. What are we hoping in? Is our ultimate hope in the right place? Ask yourself, what, what do you hope in? What would devastate you if it was taken away? 
is your hope in, in money. Jesus warns you today that no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And besides, even if you were richer than Elon Musk, what good is all that money going to do in the great day of judgment? How much of that money are you going to be able to take with you into eternity? Is your hope in, in fame or success? Well, friends, the, the adulation of the world is fleeting. It, it doesn't last. Jesus warns you again, for what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? As an adopted child of God, your reward in heaven is going to be far, far, far more glorious than anything this world can give. Jesus himself will say to you, this one is mine. He belongs to me. She belongs to me. And so crave his recognition, not the world's recognition. Maybe your hope is in comfort, in, in favorable circumstances. You need to know this, the comfort that a believer receives in heaven far outweighs anything you'll experience from the world. And the comfort that the Holy Spirit gives us now is far more satisfying than any lavish home or fancy toys that you could have. You're, you have peace. You have peace with God through Jesus Christ. And, and there is nothing more comforting than that. As Paul says in Romans 5, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And so, beloved, hope in Christ. Don't hope in anything else. Hope in him completely and perfectly and fully to the end. Hope in him to the exclusion of everything else. Only hope that is in Christ is a living hope. Only hope that is in Christ is an internal hope. Remember, you've been saved by grace, and that grace is a young glory. Grace that is just a foretaste of the grace that is ours when Christ appears. On that final day, your reward will be all of grace. Your delight will be in his grace. And the eternal joy that is yours will be all by his grace. We hope then in a God who has revealed himself to us perfectly in Scripture. He's given us all that we need for life and godliness. We don't hope in a God of our own imagination. So take up his word and read, loved ones. God has given to us his living and abiding word. And in it, he reveals himself to be a God who is more than worthy of our hope. Well, our second duty then is to live holy and reverent lives. Lives that are patterned after our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lives of obedience to him. Lives that, that fear him, that cannot bear to displease him. Lives that are no longer conformed to the passions of our former ignorance. Lives that are different from the world around us. Lives that make it obvious that we have a hope inside of us. So what motives do we have then for this kind of radical living. Well, first Peter tells us that God is our father. We're, we're his adopted children. We, we stand in relationship to God because of the great love with which he has loved us. He's loved us. He's given us his only begotten son in order that through the son's redeeming work, the father will have us. People like us as his adopted sons and daughters. Because he first loved us, then we love him. And therefore we desire to honor 
and please him. When we grab a hold of this, when we, when we rightly understand our adoption, we're never ever going to be led into a thoughtless, flippant way of living. No, we're the ones who cry out, Abba, Father. And so we're not presumptuous, but rather grateful and careful. We have supreme love for our Father, and so we dread disobeying and grieving Him. Well, second motive is this, that God is our universal judge. He is the universal judge. He judges impartially according to each one's deeds. He is omniscient. He is all-knowing. He, he knows all that we think, all that we do, all that we say, even all that we intend. And he doesn't need any prosecutor or expert witness to present evidence to him. The standard by which he judges is perfect righteousness, and he is an impartial and incorruptible judge. Now, by reminding us of this, Peter is not denying what, what Jesus says about believers not coming into judgment, but passing out of death into life. Nor is he overturning what, what Paul wrote in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He's not negating any of that. The very fact that we, though we do sin, we have a, a righteous advocate before the universal judge, before our Father makes us more and not less determined to fear God to resist any temptation to sin. When we remember that the, the judge of all the world is our Father, and He will acquit us of every sin because of the finished work of our Redeemer, that, that is to fill us with joy. That's why Peter brings this out here. But as well as joy, we are filled with, with reverence, with fear for such majestic mercy that has been lavished on us in Christ. And so how can we pray? God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If we refuse to live according to the Father's revealed will. The third motive then is that God is our redeemer. The price that God paid to ransom us from our futile ways was no less than his own son who he gave as an atoning sacrifice for all the sins of all his people. Christ suffered and died. He bore the punishment that we deserve. He rose to defeat sin and death in our stead. And so how could we, who have received this gift, live in any other way than the godly way of fear and reverence and holiness? Our final duty then is this. Love one another. Love one another. Christians are to be those who are marked out by love. Specifically for lo love for one another. We've already heard Jesus say, haven't we? By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so let us love each other purely, sincerely, earnestly, thoroughly. And remember... Remember this, you are what you eat. And so if you're feeding yourself on, on the empty husks of this world, then you will grow lifeless, hopeless, and loveless. But if we feed on the Word of God, the imperishable seed, His living Word, if we feed on the preaching of the Word, the reading of the Word, the praying of the Word, the singing of the Word, the tasting of the Word in sacrament, then we will be enlightened by truth and empowered with love. Through the word, through the word, we are transformed as we set our hope on the Christ that is revealed in that word. And as we do that, we are moved to be people who love, those who love God and those who love one another. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks and praise and glory and honor 
We bless you because of the hope that we have in Christ. Thank you for giving us a down payment of that grace now that we experience in part what at the day when Christ is revealed we will know in full. Thank you for your grace towards us. Thank you for your grace in us. Thank you that you are transforming us day by day into the image of your Son. Oh Lord, we pray, we pray for more of that work. By your Holy Spirit, please continue to sanctify each one of us. Father, we, we long to be those obedient children, those who live out your truth, those whose lives are, are marked by reverence and fear for you. Those who, who live to obey you. So Lord, we, we thank you and we praise you for all that you have done for us in Christ. For all that you have done for your church across the world. Lord, we thank you. Uh, that this is a gospel message that is not confined to one people group or, or tribe or tongue, but it is a, a universal gospel. We thank you uh, that in nearly every land there are people who, who love you, who have put their hope and faith in Jesus Christ. And Lord, we know that there are, there are some who are suffering at this time because of that those who are being persecuted in ways that, um, that we really have no, no comprehension of, those who are being thrown into prison, uh, torn away from families and loved ones, those who are even being killed, put to death because they love you. And so we pray today for your church, your church that is persecuted. We pray uh, that even now you would bring to their minds that hope that is theirs, in Christ. Oh, how, how special it will be for them who have endured such, such pain and suffering during the period of their exile to, to know fully the grace that is theirs in Jesus Christ. Oh, give them a taste of that today, we pray. Strengthen them for all that you call them to endure. And we pray that, that through their sacrifice, the gospel might go forward that your church would be multiplied and increased. We pray that you might do all of this for your great glory and honor and praise. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.